The following program is paid for by the friends and partners of Touching Lives. It doesn't matter whether you've been married once or twice divorced. It doesn't matter whether you're an alcoholic or a teetotaler. It doesn't matter whether you're righteous or unrighteous. It doesn't matter whether you believe the book or you don't. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or irreligious. It doesn't matter whether you're good or bad. It doesn't matter. We are all equally in need of the grace of God. Teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This is Touching Lives with James Merritt. Now, if you're a guest of ours today, we're in a series that we're calling Balanced. And the whole thesis of this series series is simply this. In the Gospel of John, we read that Jesus was full of grace and truth. One of the things that brought people to Jesus and that, 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 that almost like a magnet drew people to Jesus was He was full of grace and truth. Now, the story begins in Luke 7, verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and he reclined at the table. Now the Pharisee is throwing a party. You're going to see this in a moment because there were a lot of guests that were invited to this party. Now this is one of those deals that, you know, being an American like we are, when you read the Bible, I I was saying this the other day, I was uh, in a conference I was preaching in, there is so much humor in the Bible that we just don't realize we just missed. For example, we're reading here about a Pharisee that threw a party. That is an oxymoron. Okay, a Pharisee party is a contradiction. Pharisees were the fundamentalists of their day. Okay, Pharisees never got a lot of sleep. You know why they didn't get a lot of sleep? They would stay up all night worrying that somebody somewhere was having fun. (laughs) They just couldn't stand the thought of it. Pharisees today, they wouldn't have a TV in their house. They wouldn't go to movies. They wouldn't dance. They wouldn't play cards. They wouldn't listen to any music unless it was a hymn, and it better be older than Moses. I mean, think about it. So you're going to a Pharisee party? Yeah, well, no DJ, no punch, no dancing. And remember, they're Jewish, no pigs in a blanket. Man, can't wait to go to that party, right? Well, the guest list was very impressive. Important men of the synagogue was going to be there. The who's who of Jerusalem is going to be there. Simon, as we're going to see, the one of the leading Pharisees who threw this party, he knew this was going to be one blowout gig. He knew the house was going to be full. He knew people were going to drop everything they had going. They were going to clear their calendar to be at this party. You say, why? Because the headliner was Jesus. And word spread, Jesus is going to be at this party. You talk about a tough ticket. Everybody wanted to get in and see this young, handsome Galilean who overnight, just like that, had the largest Twitter following in all of Israel. Everybody wanted to meet this man named Jesus. Everywhere he went, crowds would mob him. People would sit at his feet for hours, and they would hang on every single word. And the word is out, hey, Jesus is going to to, to Simon's house. Jesus is coming to the party. And I'm telling you, everybody wanted to get into this party, and it was going to be one great party, except it didn't turn out the way Simon thought it would turn out. It really didn't produce what Simon thought it would produce. And what you're about to read in this amazing story is a Jesus that was full of grace and why grace is so amazing. Now, before I get into the message, let me just kind of full disclosure, fair warning. You better listen carefully. Because every one of us in this room, every one of us watching by TV, everyone watching on the internet right now, everyone at all of our campuses, those of you who are watching or will be watching on TV or will be listening, you are in this story. You'll see why in a moment. We're going to learn three things about grace. All right, number one, grace receives us in our sin. Grace receives us in our sin. Now, let me tell you kind of what's going on. Jesus has arrived. The party's going well. Everybody's having a good time. Jesus is relaxed. Everybody's relaxed. They're just chilling out. They were reclining on the floor eating because back in the day when you went to a party, you didn't sit at a table. You would recline on the floor. You would put your hand on, you know, your, your head in your hand like this, on your, lean on your elbow, and that's how you would, you would eat. Well, everybody's having a good time. Everybody's relaxed. Everybody's kind of listening to Jesus and looking at Jesus. And all of a sudden, 
the room goes deathly silent. All talking stops. And every eye in that room is focused on one thing that all of a sudden has made everybody extremely uncomfortable except Jesus. Verse 37, a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. Now get the picture. This is a room filled with religious leaders. This is a room filled with biblical scholars. This is a room filled with churchgoers. There was enough self-righteousness in this room to sink a cruise ship. Okay? I mean, and, and, and now here's somebody that walks in. Hey, she's not on the guest list. She didn't have a ticket. She breaks into the party. And what's even worse, she's a woman, but not just any woman. Because what she did and who she was made chins bounce off the floor. Because remember what we're told? Luke's very careful to be detailed here. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life. Literally in the Greek language it says a woman who was a sinner. Oh uh, yeah, we know what she was, right? She was a street walker. She was a prostitute. She was a call girl. In every way imaginable, she came from the wrong side of the tracks. She was the lowest of the low, socially, morally, ethically, spiritually. She was at the bottom of the barrel. You know, back in that day, the trifecta of evil and the trifecta of bad people, if you were either a tax collector or a shepherd or a prostitute, you were considered the lowest of the low. And if you happened to be a prostitute who collected taxes and had some sheep, you really had hit the trifecta. So this woman is a prostitute. Well, she may have been corrupt and she may have been carnal, but she wasn't a coward. Give her her props. She walks into a lion's den of people who see her with nothing but disdain, 180 degrees different from what she is, and they're ready to eat her alive. But she'd made up her mind, nothing's going to keep me from Jesus. Nobody's going to keep me from Jesus. I am coming into this house, and I'm going to see Jesus. Now, everything this woman had ever been taught made her feel unwelcome, not just in this house, but she knows where she is. I'm in the presence of a holy man. I'm in the presence of a prophet. I'm in the presence of a teacher. And nobody had to tell her who she, who she was. She knew who she was. Nobody had to tell her what she was. She knew what she was. And by the way, one thing you have to kind of realize in this story, it's really pretty obvious. You just have to assume this. It's really obvious this woman had seen Jesus before. She, she had been around Jesus before. She had listened to Jesus before. She had watched Jesus before. And evidently, what he said and the way he said it radically changed her life. So much to the point that she was willing even to be stoned, if that's what it took, if she could just get to Jesus. I can just imagine the first time she ever heard Jesus speak, she encountered words she had never heard before. And though she didn't know what the word was, she knew it when she heard it. She heard it clearly grace. By now, Simon, oh boy, he's hot. He has heard enough. He has seen enough. He's had enough. How dare this streetwalker walk into my party with all of my honored guests and ruin the best party of the year? How dare she do that? So listen to this. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, by the way, a little help here. When you're around Jesus, you're never just talking to yourself. Just, just a word, okay. He said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know who's touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Now, what you're going to about see is Jesus was well aware of who she was. Jesus knew exactly what she was. He knew exactly what kind of sinner she was. Can I tell you what's real tragic about this picture? Can I tell you what's wrong with this picture? Here's what was wrong. What was tragic is that Simon didn't realize the real problem. You say, okay, what was the real problem? You ready? Buckle your seatbelt. The problem was not that she was a sinner and Jesus didn't know it. 
That wasn't the problem. The problem was he was a sinner and he didn't know it. That was the problem. Jesus knew she was a sinner. He didn't know he was a sinner. And that raises, this is where I'm going to get a little bit passionate just for a minute. Why do we think, where do we get this idea that sin disqualifies us from the grace of God? Where where do we ever come up with that idea? Why is it that we would have a tendency? If somebody walked down the front of this church right now and sat right on that front row right there, and they weren't dressed like we're dressed, or maybe hardly even dressed, or they had everything from tattoos to earrings, or it's very obvious their sexual orientation is not where most of us is. Why is it that some of us would have this thought go through our mind, what are you doing here? What is it about sin that we think disqualifies us from the grace of God? Can I give you just a little secret? Sin is the only thing that qualifies us for the grace of God. Can I be honest, even more honest? I wish our church were filled with people that don't believe what we believe and don't see things the way we see them, that think this book is full of fairy tales and think, hey, it's okay to live any way I want to. God's okay. I'm okay. We're all okay. I don't believe what you believe. I don't, this resurrection business, business, I don't believe for a minute Jesus raised from the dead. You know what? I wish our church was filled with those people. That's who we're here for. Because let me want you to understand this. You don't give up your sin and then receive God's grace. You receive God's grace and then He gives you the power to give up your sin. So first of all, sin, a grace receives us in our sin. She knew what she was when she walked in. Jesus knew what she was when she walked in. And Jesus said, you're the reason I came to the party. Number two, grace rescues us from our sin doesn't just receive us in our sin, it rescues us from our sin. Now, Jesus tells a story, we're going to get back to the story in just a moment. But first, let me tell you what he does. He gives this scathing indictment of Simon, right? I mean, Simon's in his mind. Simon's letting this prostitute have it. Well, now Jesus is about to let Simon have it. You say, wait a minute, I thought he was full of grace. He is, but he just can't help himself. He's got truth too. He just has to tell the truth. So listen to what he says in verse 44. Then he turned toward the woman. Now, watch what Jesus does. This is really cool. He knows what he's doing psychologically. He turns to the woman, but he's talking to Simon, right? That's, that's pretty cool, right? He's looked at the woman, but he's talking to Simon. You see this woman? You know what Simon's saying? Uh, yeah, I see her. I came into your house, and you didn't give me any water for my feet. But she wet my feet with her tears, and she wiped them with her hair. You didn't give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Now, what Jesus just did is just call Simon on the carpet. And you you may not understand how he did that, but it's really kind of easy if you go back to the culture of that day, which, by the way, is still carried over the Middle East today. I've been to the Middle East many, many times, as you know. I'm going back to Israel next year. You see it every time you go over there. In the Middle East, hospitality is a big deal, a big deal. In the East, in the Middle East, you have a cultural responsibility to accept a stranger into your house. You have a cultural responsibility to feed that stranger. You have a cultural responsibility to house that stranger if that stranger has no place to go. They knew all about Southern hospitality long before there was a South. They, they, they understood it. So, see, here's what's going on. There is a tension in the room, not just because of what has happened, but because of what had not happened happen. Because let me take you back. Jesus walks to the doorstep of the house. He knocks on the door. Simon invites him into his house. Now, when Jesus entered that house, all the traditional courtesies of any guest you would expect didn't happen. For example, the customary greeting when a guest of honor comes into your house and you've invited them, the customary greeting is you give them a kiss on one or both cheeks. If you don't kiss them on one or both cheeks, what you're saying in effect is I'm going to ignore you. Then the guests would be seated on stools around a U-shaped couch, and before a meal was eaten, the hands had to be washed, and the feet had to be washed with a mixture of water and olive oil. 
Now, to honor your guest, if you really wanted to honor your guest, you would wash their feet yourself and you'd wash their hands yourself. But if you felt like you were too good for that, you'd have one of the servants come and wash their feet and wash their hands. And you had to do that before you ate, because if you didn't do that before you ate, you were eating a meal with unclean hands and you would be therefore considered unclean. But there was no washing of Jesus' feet. And nobody had washed his hands. And nobody had given him a kiss. And nobody had poured perfume on his feet. And then Jesus says these stinging words to Simon. I mean, you talk about cutting a guy. Jesus knew how to do it just like that. Listen to what he says. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little, you loves little. Now, now this, is so, this is so important. She didn't wash his feet, and she didn't anoint him with perfume, and she did not kiss his feet hoping to receive forgiveness. It was the other way around. Because she had been forgiven, that's why she washed his feet and kissed his feet and anointed him with perfume. No, she didn't know the word grace. If you'd walked up to her and said, hey, don't you just love grace? She'd have said, what is grace? But then if you just pointed to Jesus, she said, oh, that's grace. And then the mic drops with Jesus' next words. Then Jesus said, your sins are forgiven. Simple four-word statement, but an eternal life changer. Question. You think that street-walking prostitute ever dreamed she'd hear those words from anybody? And yet, she not only heard these words, but for the first time in her life, she heard it from the only one in the universe that could mean it and make it stick. Lady, when I say your sins are forgiven, take it to the bank. Your sins are forgiven. That's what grace does. It doesn't just receive us in our sin. It rescues us from our sin. So whenever you hear those words ever spoken, your sins are forgiven, that's grace doing the talking. So what does grace do? It receives us in our sin. You come just like you are. It rescues us from our sin. Your sins are forgiven. But then what's this last thing? Grace releases us from our sin. Now, now this is where the story really gets good. See, Jesus told a parable to Simon because he knew Simon didn't quite get what was going on. And whenever Jesus wanted to make a point, he loved to tell stories. So he tells this story. Now, Simon doesn't realize it, but the story is actually a sledgehammer that's going to hit him up the side of the head. He doesn't even know what's hitting until he tells the story. But Jesus tells this story. And you know why? What he was saying to Simon was, Simon, you've tried to put me in my place. I'm going to put you in your place. So he tells this story. Jesus says to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. By the way, whenever Jesus says, I have something to tell you, you better buckle up. I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now Jesus asked a very simple question, right? Now which of them will love him more? Let me stop right there. Let's say we don't read the rest of the verse. Does everybody, can everybody answer that question? Everybody get that? I mean, that's, a, that's an easy answer, right? I mean, it's not hard. Simon, though, it's, this is killing him. Because I want you to notice what he says. That's another funny part of the story. Simon says, uh, I suppose... No, moron, you don't suppose anything. You know the answer. The one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Story's very simple. You got two men. They both owe debts to this moneylender. One man owes ten times what the other man owes, but the one thing they have in common is neither one could pay off their debt. Now, what Jesus was saying to Simon then is what Jesus is saying to all of us now. There may be people out there that we think are ten times worse than we are. And there may be people out there that deep down we think we are ten times better than they are. But here's the sobering news. The fact of the matter is we're all sinners. 
And we are all spiritually bankrupt. We all owe a sin debt we can never pay off. So it doesn't matter whether you're a pope or a pastor or a prostitute or a pornographer. When it comes to sin, we're all dead broke. We're all bankrupt. All of your baptismal certificates and your tithing envelopes and your church attendance and your good deeds and your giving to charity, all of that stuff put together can't pay off one idol of one fraction of one scintilla of one sin. We're broke. We're all in the same boat. The problem was the prostitute, prostitute could see her sin, but the Pharisee couldn't see his. See, when she looked in the mirror, she saw how sinful she was. But when he looked in the mirror, he saw how good he thought he was. It is only when you see your goodness is worthless that you will see God's grace is priceless. You will never see how great a Savior Jesus is till you see how great a sinner you are. So, wrap this up. What's the next step? Okay, Pastor, in light of what you just said to me, how can I apply this to my life? How can this make a difference beginning today? How can this really make a practical difference in my life? Okay, here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. This is your assignment. Just today, won't worry about tomorrow, just today. I want to encourage you to take a moment and start seeing the world as if your eyes were filled with grace. Now you say, okay, what will happen if I do that? If I, if I say, okay, I'm going to start seeing the whole world with eyes filled with grace, what will be different? Here's what will happen. Guarantee it. When you begin to look at the world with eyes full of grace, you'll start seeing three things differently than maybe you've ever seen them before. Number one, you'll see yourself the way you really are, which is, just like everybody else, a sinner in need of grace. Number two, you'll see other people the way they really are. You know what? They're no worse than you are, and they're no better than you are. They're just like you, sinners in need of grace. And then you'll see Jesus the way He really is, always full of grace that we all fully need. Now, listen to how the story concludes. The other guests begin to say among themselves, who is this? Who is this masked man? Who is this who even forgives sins? I want to love what Jesus does. He doesn't even answer them. He doesn't even fool with them. He says to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now listen up, and we're done. If I haven't offended anybody yet, let me give it one more shot. <laughs> what Jesus is teaching us today is this. Whether you're a lawmaker or a lawbreaker, you are equally in need of the grace of God. It doesn't matter whether you're a liberal or a conservative. It doesn't matter whether you're gay or straight. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. It doesn't matter whether you're in the majority or minority. It doesn't matter whether you've been married once or twice divorced. It doesn't matter whether you're an alcoholic or a teetotaler. It doesn't matter whether you're righteous or unrighteous. It doesn't matter whether you believe the book or you don't. It doesn't matter whether you're religious or irreligious. It doesn't matter whether you're good or bad. It doesn't matter. We are all equally in need of the grace of God. Every one of us. Now here's the last thing, and I'm, I'm going to have a little fun here since I'm the pastor. I get to do this. We're never told what this woman's name is. I don't know what it was. You don't know what it was. So I'm going to give you my theory. I don't know that I'm right, but if I were a betting man, I'd, I'd bet Jack your salary that I'm right. <laughs> I don't know what this woman's name was before she met Jesus, but I got a strong feeling what people called her after she met Jesus. Anybody want to take a clue what you think they called her? Grace. Grace. Stay tuned for a final word from Dr. Merritt. Obviously, I've never been one, but I have been born to one, and I've been married to one, and I believe being a mother is perhaps the hardest job in the world. My mom was tireless in her care for me and my brothers. 
and her love was pure and wonderful right up until the day she went to be with the Lord. On this Mother's Day, I've got a special gift I'd like to send to every mother watching this broadcast. If you will call us right now at 1-800-413-1131 or go to our website at www.touchinglives.org to request this special Mother's Day gift, we will mail it to you right away. Motherhood is such a special God-given blessing. And I pray this Mother's Day is the best ever for every mother watching today. I wish my mom was still living so I could call her as I used to do every morning at 8.30. If your mom's still living, call her. If you can, go see her and hug her. And thank God for that precious mom. Thanks for watching the broadcast. May God bless you until we meet again right here on this station next week. You know, there's a lot of great words in the Bible, but I'll tell you one that's right up there, probably right next to Jesus, and it's the word grace. You may be surprised to learn the word grace only appears four times in the Bible, and Jesus never is quoted using the word. But you also may need to understand, if you read the Bible at all, how Jesus oozed grace and displayed the characteristics of grace over and over and over. It was grace that called a tax collector to become a disciple of Jesus. It was grace that brought a sinful woman to weep at the feet of Jesus. It was grace that raised Lazarus from the dead. We're in a series we're calling Balance, where we're studying how grace and truth must be balanced in our lives. The focus today was on grace, as we learn how every person on the planet is in need of grace, because grace helps us to see who we really are. We're sinners in desperate need of a Savior, and the good news today is this. We have a Savior in Jesus who is ready to pour His grace on us. Next week, our focus is on truth. So be sure to return as we continue in our series called Balance right here on Touching Lives. Touching Lives, teaching people everywhere who Jesus is and why they need Him. This program is sponsored by Touching Lives Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.